Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the Foreign Policy Research uh, Institute either this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, my name is Aaron Stein. Uh, I am the Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, and today we are going to be talking about a recent publication, uh, which if you have not read yet, uh, I, fully, uh, pro I fully encourage you to do so. Uh, and you can access it via uh, links in the chat box, uh, discussing the Wagner Group's playbook in Africa. Uh, and joining us to discuss this is the panel uh, put together, you can see in front of your screen, uh, with the report author, uh, Rafael Parens, uh, who is an international security researcher focused on Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, Katrina Doxy is an, associate, is an associate director and associate fellow for the Transnational Threats Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Anu Adeyo, uh, I hope I got that right, uh, is a Nigerian journalist currently serving as the Mo Ibrahim Foundation Academy Fellow at Chatham House. Uh, and Jack Margolin, uh, is, who is the program director uh, of the Conflict Finance and Irregular Threats Program at C4ADS. Uh, for most of us, uh, we're old hat at these online webinars, but in case this is your first time, um, uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, we will give opening remarks. Each panelist will go through uh, for about 30 to 35 minutes um, in total across all four. And then we will move on to moderated discussion. For the moderated discussions, we do want to hear from you. It is far more fun when these are interactive. It certainly keeps me on my toes when I have to uh, be moderating questions. So please, you know, use the Q and A function at the bottom of the uh, of the of the uh, screen here. So Q and A, type your question in, and I will get to you as forward. Get to you uh, uh, your question as time permits. So with that, we're going to go straight down the list of the email invites. So uh, Raphael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, so as a roadmap map to um, sort of what I'll be looking at um, in, my, in my brief uh, overview, I'm gonna touch on my paper, the approaches, primary findings, followed by a few updates on Mali, uh, Wagner a group in Ukraine, and the impacts of food prices in Africa on security in the region. So first of all, Wagner has immersed itself in Libya, Madagascar, Mozambique, Central African Republic, and Sudan. Um, it's a private Russian, um, Russian owned military contractor, um, but, uh, it, in fact, does not um, completely overlap with the Russian state. Uh, its status as an independent uh, contractor lends it a, a certain level of unpredictability, um, while also giving Russia plausible de deniability when it um, is making foreign pol policy decisions. Um, the group can act in a way that's distant from the state itself, um, while also giving, giving Russia a tool in building uh, military cooperation with, with other states. So um, the way I looked at it um, in my paper was a three-tiered approach um, that Wagner uh, pursues in Africa. Uh, first, it conducts a disinformation and pro-government information warfare strategy. Second, it secures payment for its services through concessions and extractive industries. And third, uh, it becomes involved with the country's national security appar apparatus, launching a relationship directly with uh, Russia's military through training, advising personal security and anti-insurgency operations. So in my paper, I look at Sudan and CAR, but since we're a bit short on time, I'm, I'm going to skip those examples. You can uh, read about them if you haven't read about them yet, and I'll go straight to the main bit, which is uh, Wagner and Mali. So Mali has been facing a long-term insurgency, um, at least the, um, the national government has. Uh, France became involved in 2012, first in Operation Serval, and then Operation Barkhan, um, as well as in MINUSMA under UN Resolution 2391. Um, then uh, Wagner became involved very recently in the past uh, year to two years. Um, first, again, in, in its strategy that it pursued in both CAR and Sudan, um, beginning with a disinformation campaign, um, uh, Wagner associate Maxim Shugali released a public opinion poll purporting to show 87% support among millions for the government's outreach to Wagner. Um, this is put out by a foundation that is on the US sanctions list, um, so perhaps not the best source. Um, then moving forward, the government agreed to hire uh, 1,000 Wagner Group contractors, uh, primarily for counterterrorism operations, but also for training and close protection. Um, just around this period, uh, the government also bought four Russian attack helicopters, um, which were allegedly delivered as a donation. Um, but you know, the relationship between this and uh, the, in the entrance of Wagner into the country is, is certainly something to think about. Um, so. In Mali, uh, Wagner is going to see a bit of a, um, a kind of different um, problem set relative to CAR or Sudan. Um, 
the mining or investment uh, sort of opportunities in country are, are a bit more difficult than they were in these those other two countries. Um, they're ra rather insufficient in order um, to pay Wagner. They're harder to exploit. Uh, government regulations are stricter and several artisanal mines are controlled by armed groups in the country. Um, and I just wanted to, to put kind of my paper in perspective. Um, when I wrote this, um, when I was writing this in January of this year, um, I initially thought my kind of thesis would be looking at how Wagner would be deterred in Mali because uh, of the strong French uh, military and political investment in the country. However, President Macron's decision to pull out his, uh, the majority of his forces in February uh, forced me to reevaluate how I looked at Wagner in France, um, particularly in the Sahel. Um, so obviously, initially, there were strong uh, Western responses to Wagner. This included sanctions, asset freezes, um, and obviously the French commitment had been strong in the past. Uh, the French force in, in uh, Mali was three to 5,000 troops, whereas it was significantly smaller in other countries, I think 100 to about 300 in car. Um, and yet, uh, despite all of this, um, the French did in fact pull most of their forces out recently, which is, is definitely a, a political uh, victory for, for Wagner in country. Um, so most recently, uh, US AFRICOM Commander General Stephen Townsend stated that Wagner had deployed troops to the country in January. Uh, a recent report by uh, C CSIS and Katrina Doxy, who was on this panel, um, highlighted aerial surveillance photos um, of at least three camps that, that Wagner has built in country. Um, the, the force has uh, begun engaging with jihadi forces in the country and, of course, um, is moving towards um, some human rights violations. It's been involved in atrocities, killing 300 men in the town of Mora in March, um, which were allegedly both civilians and insurgents, but who's, who's to say on that? Wagner has also begun chipping away at any remaining support for France and Mali. Um, after the handover of the Gossi military base from French military forces to Wagner during the former's drawdown, uh, French drone footage uh, shows Caucasian troops hurriedly bearing bodies near the camp. Wagner has proceeded to blame these on uh, the French, but of course the drone footage would perhaps suggest something otherwise. So going forward, um, Wagner is going to be dealing with obviously the um, mining and payment issues in the country, but also the sanctions and um, the problems therein because, uh, I mean, both the sanctions on the group itself and also the sanctions um, having taken place um, on Russia, you know, during this conflict in Ukraine. So kind of going forward, um, there's the concern for Burkina Faso and potential um, future involvement of, of, uh, of Wagner in the region. Um, the recent coup in the country um, occurred after the president had spoken to the coup leader about Wagner becoming involved in the country, um, with the coup happening very soon after. Uh, there are potential um, Potential sources suggest perhaps that uh, Wagner is already involved on the ground um, with the quick, you know, distribution of pro-Russian sort of propaganda tools. Um, so we'll we will see how that goes. Um, and I'm running out of time, but I will quickly point out that um, Wagner has allegedly been involved in Ukraine. They've been involved in at least one um, incidence of, of war crimes occurring according to German military intelligence in Bucha, Ukraine. Um, they've alleg allegedly been deployed um, for such high-profile missions as the assassination of um, President Zelensky. Uh, so at this point, you know, we're really going to have to see where where Russia um, and where the Wagner Group um, themselves are planning on, on going in the future and what their kind of strategic avenue is, is going to look like um, in the near future. So thank you, Eric. Well, thank you. Uh, and Katrina, as you were uh, name checked in uh, Raphael's open comments, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you all for having me uh, here today and Raphael for a great report. Um, which I'm not just saying because you just uh, did reference some of the work that I've done with my team at CSIS. Um, so I want to start out, I think uh, Raphael's done a great job of just kind of an overview of what we've been seeing um, from the Wagner group and what we're seeing in Mali. I'm going to start out kind of a macro level, the trends that my team has been tracking in terms of uh, Russian PMC activities expanding in recent years, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, look at a few of the trends that we've seen and then kind of zoom in on uh, what we're anticipating in Mali and try to do that in a few minutes. So um, I think the, the first big thing I would flag is that we've seen a really strong increase in the number of Russian private military companies that are operating worldwide over the past several years. 
So we've seen about a sevenfold increase just going from 2015 uh, when there were PMCs from Russia operating in about four countries to 28 countries in 2021. And over half of those countries in 2021 were located in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's kind of Sub-Saharan Africa plus Libya when we're looking at the continent as a whole. And so we've seen this model really um, pick up as um, a tool of irregular warfare where Russia can send in private military companies like most infamously the Wagner Group since about 2014 um, with the first invasion of Ukraine. Of course, private military companies had been long in use before this. Um, you know, the Wagner Group is capitalizing on the uh, legacy of other Russian PMCs such as Moran Security Group and others. But this is, you know, really since about 2014, kind of a concentrated strategy that we're seeing. And we're seeing that strategy evolve and really be refined as PMCs are used in different conflicts uh, and for different purposes. So we saw this in places like Ukraine, uh, Syria, Libya, and we've really seen this evolution of the model as PMCs have moved into sub-Saharan Africa, where they are, as Raphael noted, exchanging these kind of security, training, intelligence, information ops capabilities uh, for economic gains, largely in the form of mining concessions, access to natural resources, primarily um, minerals and energy resources, which, you know, up until kind of the, the recent financial sanctions on Russia have really been the two areas where the Russian economy remains the most competitive. Um, and we really see that um, they're, in a lot of cases, undercutting uh, Western influence in these countries, particularly when they target uh, Francophone Africa. They are um, purposely underbidding their competitors um, in part because they're able to gain not just their monthly salaries, but also this access to various other uh, natural resources and in some cases additional contracts. Um, and they're able to um, gain just geopolitical uh, influence, expanding Russia's uh, sphere of influence as well as ability to project power. So this includes seeking to establish new military bases, uh, most notably um, with plans to potentially create a new Russian naval base at Port Sudan, which would give them power projection into the Red Sea, which is something that Russia has sought for a long time. So we've seen sort of this, this concentrated model spreading across Africa and some of the big trends that we've seen there, um, as I mentioned, include trying to kind of supplant Western influence including using disinformation and other propaganda to undermine longstanding relationships with France, um, as well as pursuing these economic gains. And that's something that we've really seen replicated in Mali. I think one of the really important things to note is that when they came in, you know, we saw them sort of preempt the deployment of Wagner with uh, this broader uh, disinformation campaign. And I should note that Wagner, which is linked back to Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, is part of this broader network of companies under Prigozhin that includes uh, the Internet Research Agency or the IRA, which was the um, organization that was linked to a lot of the Russian meddling in the U.S. election in 2016. So we're seeing that playbook continue to play out across a lot of these cases. But when we think about disinformation, really, um, you know, clearing the way for Wagner to come in, uh, spreading acceptance of Russian assistance, it's important to note that this doesn't just happen in a vacuum. They're preying on, you know, decades, and in the case of Mali, over half a century of kind of building tensions and resentment around neocolonial attitudes in Mali, uh, different tensions with the French, including most recently looking at uh, something like Operation Barkhan operating in a country where, you know, there were successes early on, more around 2014, but in recent years, we really haven't seen the French and the broader um, European Union and allied presence uh, in the form of uh, Takuba really have those monumental impacts. We haven't seen them be able to address the really root causes of violence in the country. And we see this just continuing paradoxical relationship where France both wants to be the preeminent partner for a country like Mali and its other former uh, colonial holdings but it also wants to do less on the continent. It wants to do less in the region. There's been a lot of conversation 
even before the French decided to pull out of Mali about doing less, drawing down troop numbers, this idea of passing over ownership of the problem to the local government. But when change isn't really happening, even with that assistance force in there, the local government doesn't view that it's possible to do a loan and France is not willing to accept someone else stepping in. So there are a lot of complicated challenges that date back uh, to colonial times underlying all of this, with, which Russia and the Wagner group have been able to capitalize on. And I think that going forward um, in Mali, now that we have the Russians in there and doing these operations, there are a lot of really strong causes for concern, um, both looking at the atrocities that we've seen so far um, with uh, things most notably like the attack at Moro, but also a variety of other atrocities that groups like Human Rights Watch have been tracking over the past months, uh, committed by Wagner and local soldiers, including units uh, that include both of them, uh, is that we're going to, you know, we're going to see this uh, continued trend of atrocities, indiscriminate killings of civilians. Uh, and this is something that is sort of both in the Wagner playbook uh, and also in uh, just the history of the local forces in Mali. So there have been longstanding issues in Mali of the armed forces uh, committing violence against civilians. However, notably, um, based on data tracked both by Human Rights Watch and the Africa uh, Center for Strategic Studies in the first quarter of 2022, there were more uh, state force connected killings of civilians than in all of 2021. And so we've seen this major uptick in something that was already a trend with forces like the Wagner Group. We've seen widespread atrocities and crimes against humanity in their other deployments, most notably in the Central African Republic, where last summer the UN Security Council released a very detailed report documenting a lot of uh, those crimes against humanity, including indiscriminate killings, including at active worship services, uh, including widespread rapes, pillaging, um, occupying facilities such as schools and medical facilities and UN facilities. This is something that is a longstanding trend uh, for Wagner. It's something that a regime uh, like the Russian uh, government is comfortable turning a blind eye to or even tacitly supporting and so then when you have a local government like the Malian Junta that's also sort of turning a blind eye and really just relying on Wagner to come in as sort of a coup proofing mechanism to be able to uh, keep security long enough to keep their regime in power, it's advantageous to not be held accountable for those things. Uh, one of the problems we've seen, particularly in the wake of Mora, is that because the Junta controls airspace in Mali, international observers and aid are not able to get in there on the ground, especially in the more remote rural areas. And I think we're going to continue having trouble really tracking transparently what's going on. Uh, but that's going to be something that's going to be absolutely vital, both for being able to provide aid and also in the longer term, hold people accountable for the atrocities that we're seeing. And I think that that just really highlights, again, as we're thinking about ways to uh, you know, combat this trend, the importance of uh, transparent information, open source research, which a lot of my colleagues on this call have been doing a fantastic job of really elevating and bringing into the public eye, and also the importance of really empowering and highlighting local journalists who are able to get on the scene, conduct these really vital interviews, and really get the stories of what's going on, because that's such an important part of building this longer term narrative of how the Wagner Group and how local forces conduct operations, how they've honed this model, and ways that we can uh, both combat the ways that they're exploiting uh, crisis situations for their own gain, and also really hold people accountable for the atrocities that we're seeing. So happy to go into all of that in more detail, but I will pass on to the next speaker. Thanks, Katrina. Um, uh, with that, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I think in like the short time I have, I just want to quickly run through an overview of why Russia uses the Wagner Group and um, give the um, African perspective on why countries like Mali have turned into Russia, which is something Katrina uh, briefly alluded to in her opening remarks. So I think it's worth um, starting out and, and noting that 
uh, private military companies are illegal inside Russia because the state maintains that only it should have a monopoly on defense and that private armies uh, should, could have a destabilizing effect on the country. So Wagner um, exists in this kind of form where it exists, but it doesn't really exist because it's uh, technically not legal inside um, Russia. Uh, yet, um, private military companies like Wagner have been deployed abroad, most notably in Syria. Uh, and then uh, President Putin has said that if Wagner violates um, any rules, that the prosecutor general of Russia should evaluate them. But that if they don't break any Russian laws, they can carry out uh, businesses, business anywhere in the world as they please. Um, and I think that one of the main reasons why Wagner is a very important tool for, for Russia is the fact that apart from the fact that it is uh, it gives them plausible deniability because it's not um, the, Russia's um, uh, national army, um, Russia lacks the financial effort of its competitors, uh, say China, the US and the EU in Africa, right? And now Moscow is looking to do diplomacy on the chip. And this is like an inverse of the Soviet era strategy when um, at, the, at the end of the Soviet Union, they all they had to show for their efforts in Africa was mostly about $17 billion in debt uh, that uh, African countries were indebted to them. Uh, so right now, Russia is trying to portray itself as a reliable ally in the fight against jihadists and insurgents as Western attention turns elsewhere, right? So when they first got into the Central African Republic, in 2018, it was because um, the French had uh, withdrawn their troops. And it's kind of a similar playbook now that France, um, last year in, in June of 2021, President Macron announced that he was going to reduce half of his troops in the Sahel. Uh, and, and most of the French troops based in, in the Sahel are stationed in Mali. And this, um, this annoyed um, the Malian regime because they felt that they were abandoned. Uh, that's according to the words of the uh, Malian prime minister. And so they decided that they were going to start shopping for security partners elsewhere. And so they, they decided that Wagner was going to be um, their new security partners, despite the fact that Wagner has been credibly accused of human rights abuses uh, by, the United Nation, by the United Nations. And I, I think we are starting to see how brutal uh, Wagner can be as an operation, uh, operational force with the massacre in Mara that happened a few weeks ago where about uh, 300 people were reported killed uh, by various human rights organizations, right? And if you look at how Wagner, where Wagner is most active, right? They are most active in the Central African Republic where um, the president is barely in control of anywhere in the country beyond the capital of Bandi. And so, uh, president Wadera, who is the uh, president of the Central African Republic, relies heavily on Wagner Group. Um, his security team is composed uh, of Wagner mercenaries, and his, uh, his national security advisor is a former uh, FSB agent called uh, Valery Zakharov. And I think in the Central African Republic as well, like Russia's influence is so significant that they've been involved in peace talks between the government and the rebels. So I think that's the model that the Malians seem to be interested in, right? They say they need assistance fighting insurgents. And that is true, right? The French, um, they've been in, they, they've been in, in Mali since about 2012, first with Operation Serval and then Operation Bakane. And even with French troops, American intelligence gathering, about 15,000 uh, UN uh, forces stationed there. The Malian government is barely in control of the country beyond Bamako and some of its major cities. More than 6,000 people have been killed in the conflict and about 2 million have had to flee their homes, right? And the Malian uh, government is so desperate that they are looking into uh, a, a containment strategy which they can uh, maybe dialogue with some of, um, um, for example, Al-Qaeda's uh, local affiliates. And I think one of the uh, undercurrents here as well is that there were two coups in Mali in 2020 and 2021. And that led to a breakdown of relationship uh, between Mali and France and also between Mali and their partners in ECOWAS, right? Which is the economic community of West African states. That um, 
those two coups have led to very heavy sanctions um, being placed on Mali. This is probably one of the, this is probably the harshest sanctions in ECOWAS history. And because of that, um, Mali is isolated uh, on the world stage. And so increasingly they are turning more and more to Russia. Uh, if you look at uh, what happened in January when um, the ECOWAS sanctions were announced, uh, France tried to get the UN Security Council to, uh, uh, to vote on that and, and support those sanctions. But crucially, Russia and China um, vetoed uh, that resolution. Uh, and so Russia is increasingly Mali's only friend uh, on the global stage. Uh, but I think uh, to finish my opening remarks, I think it's worth noting that Russia's Russian assistance is very popular with Malians at this moment, right? Like if you uh, read news reports or like talk to people who are based in Bamako, you know that so many people are openly in support of Russian assistance in their country. Uh, I think some of it is down to uh, a reflexive support for the military junta that promised to tackle the, the jihadists, right? So um, after the downfall of democracy in 2020 and 2021, um, I think contrary to what most um, people would expect, uh, the Malian people, most of them certainly are in favor of the military junta. And so by default, they support the, the uh, military regime's position to bring in the Russians. And I think some of it is also down to the frustrations of what people see as France's lack of progress in the fight against the jihadists, right? So people think that France has been in the country since 2012, uh, and they have not done much to contain the jihadists, right? And I think uh, finally, the problem of Islamic jihadists in this region cannot be solved solely using uh, military force, right? And I think that's one of the problems that Wagner Group themselves will eventually come up against in, in Mali, right? Because most of these problems are based on social economic problems, right? There are young men joining these groups not out of um, any ideology to um, terrorism or jihadism. But so many people are joining because it's a way out of uh, government neglect, especially if you look at places in Northern Mali, like in Gao and in Meneka. So many of these people are unemployed. And if you have someone offering you $50 a week, AK-47 and, 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 a, and a motorcycle to people who are unemployed and frustrated, that sounds like a good deal. So I think, we cannot um, solve all of the problems by using uh, military force. And I think those uh, people who have been trying to solve this problem since 2012, like the French, have not been able to get to the root of, root of these problems. And I think the, um, the Russians, Wagner Group as well, are going to come up against the same problem. And so I think it, it, it's worth like, keeping an eye on, on how the operations will, will progress. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jack, uh, you're the final in this first go around, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron, um, and thank you, Rafael, Hanu, and Katrina. Um, benefited a lot from the work that all of you have. Thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, so, the organization where I work, C4ADS, we focus on using publicly available information and emerging technology to analyze illicit networks, international crime, and conflict. My team specifically focuses on the nexus between illicit networks and armed violence. Um, and myself with a background at looking at arms trafficking in Africa and also a history working on Russia and Eastern Europe. That's sort of what drew me to looking at the Wagner Group. I'm gonna explain a little bit of kind of how we view the Wagner Group as an illicit network, which is I think an important framing um, and the sort of way that that network theory, the way that we would approach that sort of, uh, that type of organization can be really helpful to thinking about not only how to understand the Wagner Group, but also how to counter it effectively, um, which I think is a, a sort of a, a very difficult question, um, particularly as we're looking at the continued successes of the Wagner Group um, and you know, the fact that it's able to continue having an impact despite the fact that Russia has so much time and attention being focused on Ukraine. Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about that, just the context of sort of Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Wagner's Africa deployments. Um, and, use that to try and I think talk a little bit about maybe what this means more broadly. Um, so as I said, our organization focuses on illicit and using publicly available information 
we've been working on tracking the Wagner Group using Russian corporate property, customs, residency, employment, et cetera, data, um, alongside things like aircraft tracking and alongside vessel tracking and similar data sets um, in the countries where Wagner is operating. Um, so principally our focus has been places like Syria, Sudan, Central African Republic, but not Madagascar, um, less on Mali, but um, in all those places, I would say that we've seen, first of all, the way that this network functions is sort of like a, a diffuse big tent uh, network that has a couple of commonalities, I would say largely across operations, but also learns from experience and is adaptable. Um, and I think that's one of the advantages that private military companies in general present, but particularly an illicit network like Wagner presents uh, for the Russian state in order to serve its foreign policy objectives. So first of all, I totally echo uh, Raphael's sort of breakdown of you have a commercial, a political interference and like a military capacity building slash combat arms competency. I think that that sort of like triple threat package really well defines what it is that Wagner pitches, what they offer. Um, what I would say is that it's very different how it plays out in different countries, right? So also in terms of the amount of success it has, like I think a lot of us are familiar with how things went in Madagascar and the answer is like not well, despite the fact that a lot of the ingredients were there for them to be effective. It was just largely chalk it up to hubris and maybe bring in Portuguese speakers if you're going to be in, uh, in Mozambique. I'm sorry. So Madagascar, Mozambique. Madagascar, they also had similarly limited success because of the fact that it was basically not well thought out in terms of repercussions for their impact on the mining industry, et cetera. And all those places, they should benefit from sort of legacy Russian security networks that can provide them with information on conditions on the ground, what they should be aware of in terms of not only militant threats, but also national politics, uh, the commercial environment, et cetera. In some places, they use that much more effectively than in others. I use that example to say in Mozambique, they did not use it effectively. In places like Mali and Central African Republic, they've used it quite effectively. Similarly, we see them sort of applying these sort of three different verticals that Raphael described um, very differently in different places. Um, what I would compare there is, for example, okay, Central African Republic, that's a very mature deployment. They've gotten to the point where also something worth mentioning and talking about today, Russia now plays a significant role in, in the Central African Republic security. And whether we like it or not, um, they are an important factor in the current security situation in the Central African Republic, in which FACA, the government under Twadera, controls more of the country than they did months ago. Um, the sudden removal of Wagner from that, that equation would be massively destabilizing. Um, and I think that we can we can look at that and we can we can we can acknowledge that without having to paper over their their human rights abuses, their involvement in atrocities, et cetera. But I think it's it's worth being conscious of the fact that one of the consequences to a mature, successful deployment of an illicit network like this, particularly one like Wagner that can benefit from its relationship with the Russian state, et cetera, is that it will start to become very, very important and removing that network or trying to counter it is going to have knock-on effects that we need to consider. What is our actual mission in attempting to counter the Wagner Group? Is it is it regional peace and security? Because that question then becomes much more complicated. Compare that to somewhere like Sudan, which has also had a, a combat arms component to it, um, which has also had a military tra training component to it, where Wagner has managed to occupy this space where they, they've mostly, I think, been clever about how they sit between the different factions, whether it's the Sudanese armed forces, the rapid support forces, et cetera. Um, they weathered the revolution in 2019 relatively well and managed to basically continue to occupy a space in Sudan where they weren't run out of the country in the light of a sort of new civilian-led transitional government. They maintain a presence there, they maintain relationships. Um, but that, that presence, that relationship that they have is nothing like what they have in the Central African Republic. They've modulated it, and I think it's also probably has to do with resource limitations, but they modulated that in a way that I think they anticipate allowing them to have much more bang for their buck. Um, the other thing I would say there, and again, without getting too far into like Mali on this, but I think it's important because I, I, I imagine, I anticipate that it will be similar as we see a lot of failures to coordinate across different sort of capacity, like military capacity building combat arms components of Wagner and these different deployments. So there are ample opportunities for the Wagner forces in Sudan to take action against non-state armed groups that stage that use Sudan as a staging area for activity in the Central African Republic, and they don't. And part of that is because that would mess up their business. 
um, it would make things much more complicated with their relationship with different organizations in Sudan. Um, and from my understanding, especially talking to journalists, people in country, there is, uh, there's communication, some coordination, but it's not to say that this is acting as one sort of monolithic entity. Where things start to become one monolithic entity, insofar as we can call it that, where things become a diffuse network that is interconnected is as we sort of go up the commercial chain, when we start looking at finance, logistics, and how people are paid. And this is where I think things get really confusing. And the, I think we can all agree there is no like one Wagner group, right? Um, but where we start seeing, for example, Ukraine's Ministry of Defense saying, this isn't Wagner, it's something called Liga. And my first question there would be, you know, is that just a legal entity that's being used to pay people and pay for logistics? Because Wagner uses more than, has used more than 40 of those in like a two year span alone, where we really went deep on that, like 2017, 2018, like that was 40 different Russian companies being used to pay people and move stuff. Um, so that makes things very complicated, but all those companies, the uses they may be, still operate under an umbrella in which they are able to benefit from the infrastructure that's been set up by Yevgeny Prigozhin, particularly sort of starting with his Concord group of companies and branching outwards, um, in particular, looking at information leaked by folks like the Dossier Center. Um, you can see that the, the basically the, the coordination, the accounting, the logistics are all being run through a smaller group of companies that tie back to Concord and Yevropolis, which was sort of one of the, I would say like prime generation, like initial round of companies established to do this business, in that case, particularly in Syria. And that company's still around, and as a recent uh, New Lines report showed, had continued to win favorable contracts, not just with the Syrian government, but also to benefit from loan agreements between Russia and Syria. So um, understanding that, net, that this is basically constructed as a network of legal entities and individuals that have relationships, those relationships are fluid. We have individuals like Raphael Mitch and Maxime Chugolier who can kind of sit between these networks and not be as firmly affiliated with them, but still be in their pay from time to time, um, as is embodied by, for example, his activity in Libya, for example. Um, and having that flexibility and that relationship to interact with that larger ecosystem of what we could deem friendly firms or government organized NGOs, basically Russia's sort of larger semi-state uh, influence apparatus um, that I think allows them to be flexible, move quickly and play on all these fronts where they're doing combat arms or doing propaganda, et cetera. Um, I think that others here have also already acknowledged the point that I was also gonna make, which I think is particularly important in Mali. Um, I think that Rafael, Katrina, I know you, you've all acknowledged this in, in different ways, which is that um, the context is also important in terms of the, the local attitude towards Wagner and towards other foreign powers. Um, the fact that there is a lot of organic sentiment in Mali that's extremely anti-French. And if you're coming in as a, a, a powerful state, a great power, and you're positioning yourself um, in opposition to France and as a supporter of, of the, the, the very popular military coup in Bamako, um, then that's gonna be something that is, yeah, that's, that's gonna win you a lot of favor, um, regardless of who you are. And there's sure there are signs of like unusual things, particularly in the types of symbols we might see in some of the in-jokes that we see being made on social media or at protests. But generally, I, I wouldn't say that seeing a Russian flag somewhere in like West Africa is, is in itself a symbol of some kind of Russian influence operation. Even if that flag was given to somebody through an embassy or something like that, that, that doesn't indicate to us that, that sentiment's not there. Compare that with somewhere like Sudan, um, where Wagner is, is backing an immensely unpopular uh, coup government effectively that has seized power in that country um, after a transitional period that saw great strides, um, some abortive efforts, but generally progress towards um, greater economic freedom, greater political religious freedom, gender freedoms, et cetera, especially where a group of like educated, young, ambitious folks, particularly in Khartoum, but not just in Khartoum, um, saw themselves having much greater prospects than they had under the Bashir regime. Now they're seeing that rolled back. The Russians are siding with the people that are rolling that back. Um, and I think that that's something that young people appreciate there and have very little patience for. Um, compare that to somewhere like the Bangui or Bamako, urban centers in which military governance is far more popular. I think it's a very different dynamic. Um, the last thing I'd say on that is yet yeah, the sort of rural urban dynamic in these countries makes it very difficult for us to assess true attitudes towards Wagner. Um, generally, the understanding of the Central African Republic has been 
amongst uh, journalists, civil society, uh, aid workers that um, attitudes in rural or provincial areas were much more at least complicated, if not negative towards Wagner than they were in places in the urban centers, effectively in Bangui. Um, and that was due to the fact that those populations were much likely to much more likely to have negative encounters with those specific units, with those uh, with those contractors, mercenaries, instructors, everyone who referred to them. Last thing I'll say to keep it short here um, is that um, this network has evolved over time and it's gotten clever and better at hiding. When I started looking at the Wagner Group as like a passion project, they were they had terrible, terrible tradecraft, um, which I wasn't complaining about at the time. They've made it much more interesting and much more difficult. I think particularly, I mean, Katrina, your team has done great work with satellite imagery and I think to, to identify um, some activity that's not as available as it used to be. Um, but certainly what we used to be able to do using certain data resources in Russia and in flight tracking, they've made much more difficult, but not impossible. And I think this is part of what's important to understand about the Wagner Group. Their advantage for the Russian state is that they nest in top of this licit system of trade and finance. So it's, they, they, they can move things faster and cheaper in many cases than the Russian military can. They have that degree of deniability, et cetera. But that also makes them really vulnerable. If we can kick them out of that system, if we can make it more difficult for them to do business, then their sort of marginal utility degrades dramatically. Um, and I think that's represented by the fact that we've seen action taken internationally to punish uh, commercial providers of services, including logistics for Wagner. And we've seen them turn more and more to things like contracting with Russian state-owned airlines up to the Ministry of Defense, things like that. So that indicates to me that that space has become somewhat constrained. Um, in terms of what that means and how they'll apply those, relations, that, 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 those lessons to Ukraine, I don't know. I don't know how well that institutional knowledge is stored and disseminated. I will say that um, I will say that I think that a lot of reporting that we've seen around huge wholesale movements of Wagner combatants from countries, particularly the Central African Republic, to Ukraine have been overblown or inaccurate. Um, I would I would encourage people to exercise a lot of caution and and reading those types of reports because this group has a lot of incentives to misrepresent their importance in that conflict and more broadly in executing Russian foreign policy aims. Um, but I would say that generally, yes, I absolutely am not surprised that, that Wagner is, is being used in Ukraine. We should keep in mind also what they do best, which is working alongside proxy forces, um, as well as keep in mind what the other panelists here pointed out around their history, around uh, human rights abuses and atrocities. Um, so I think it'll be increasingly important into the future to identify where this network, that sort of, that layer of legal entities is involved in facilitating finance and logistics and really making this a useful organization, where those are, where they can be countered, and then also understanding what the long-term consequences are for Wagner's integration with regional security architecture in places like the Central African Republic. And finally, I think that the best thing we can do to counter them in places, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, is just be a better partner. And I think that other people have, have sort of alluded to this as well, right, which is listen more to your partners about what they need. That doesn't mean you have to endorse a military dictatorship, but it does maybe mean that you need to understand when a counterinsurgency campaign is not proving effective. Um, it does maybe mean that you need to perhaps consider in faith reasons for a mixed popularity. Um, it does mean that you need to be prepared to be outbid by a foreign mercenary army. And if we can't compete in the sort of open market of force and ideas and diplomacy, with, uh, with, with a, a mercenary army that had a history of pretty dramatic failures, um, then I don't necessarily think that there's, there's the sort of Western states of the EU has the right to assume that, that they, they deserve to be partners in those countries. Uh, that's the sort of hard way of putting it. Well, thanks uh, for that. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I, I wanna save some time for some questions and answers here. We have about 15 minutes left and I know we have um, seven questions but usually they, these things have a have a have a way of of water falling once we start asking them uh, i want to turn towards you know one of the questions here is and i think it was brought up i can't remember which panelist is 
How does Wagner and anybody just sort of pop in here? How does Wagner serve broader Russian interests in Africa? And do they clash, you know, particularly with other external powers? Um, the, particular, the actual question here was about uh, China, uh, but perhaps there's others. Well, we've talked a lot about the French, um, but, you know, perhaps, you know, taking on those two questions, Russian interests and do those Russian interests uh, clash with others who may have interests in the continent as well? On the uh, on the clash piece, I would point to an article by uh, Sam Romani and Chris Miller. I'll put it in the chat right now, but it talks about um, some of the conflict between uh, China and Russia uh, in the Horn of Africa. So that might be something that people want to look in. I could also jump in um, both on the clash and on the sort of process of representing Russian interests. First, on the clash, um, I think that um, you know, Raphael has just um, shared that article. I would also note that there isn't a lot of overlap necessarily in the way China is operating, including through its own private security companies in Africa and the way that Russia is operating. Uh, the Chinese model for using private contractors is, I think, much more measured and deliberate. Um, it's very much based around, you know, building up long term commercial interests and partnerships and they're kind of picky about who they work with, whereas Russia um, has really, to put it a little uh, globally, just kind of thrown everything at the wall and seen what stuck. Um, you know, we've seen uh, the, the first Russia-Africa summit in Sochi in 2019 um, as really this emblem of Russia's new efforts to develop these different diplomatic and security cooperation partnerships with countries in Africa, where you know, at the summit, they literally just invited everyone and tried to get as many deals as they could and have continued to pursue that. We, you know, we've been seeing news that despite kind of some questions from analysts about whether or not it would be held, the next summit is still being planned on for this fall in pursuing those agreements. And Russia, you know, the Wagner Group and other Russian PMCs are oftentimes, and this kind of also gets into how they're pursuing Russian interests, uh, they're being used to help either facilitate these deals um, in a lot of cases in terms of direct involvement. So for instance, in a country like the Central African Republic, uh, Wagner troops serving as these uh, quote unquote trainers, which is actually part of why we can track them so much because they're kind of reported at least to some degree in terms of even UN monitoring for the, Ru the Russian trainers in the Central African Republic. Notably there, um, they actually were deployed with UN approval um, because it was part of a Russian deal to get around the arms embargo going into CAR. Um, but across these different deployments, in some cases, you know, they're being used to fulfill the terms of these agreements directly, like in the Central African Republic. In some places, um, they're deployed in much smaller numbers. So, you know, in some of these smaller deployments like Nigeria, other countries, you have maybe 20 Wagner troops there who are there primarily to help facilitate, you know, the arrival of Russian equipment and arms sales to teach people how to use equipment um, and to do kind of very minor security cooperation training, much more of a sort of technical assistance role just in fulfilling the terms of. Uh, different agreements. And then in some of these cases, Wagner is coming in a bit more independently, but sort of uh, laying the groundwork for these other agreements to be possible um, and really setting up more of a you know, positive relationship between Russia and the host country to hopefully facilitate more agreements in the future. Um, and in some terms, in some uh, cases, they're actually getting some of the things that the Russian government wants long term in the terms of Wagner's arrival. So part of the agreement in Sudan with the Bashir regime when Wagner first went in involved uh, the involvement at Port Sudan and the potential establishment of a naval base. And that's something that you know, continued uh, even after the regime fell. Um, in other countries, you know, you have various things worked in. So in Madagascar, part of the original agreement and coming in uh, sending in political advisors ahead of the presidential election also involved uh, securing contracts for port renovation for Russian companies, including companies in this sort of broader Prigozhin Wagner orbit. Um, so they're being used kind of as a discrete tool of irregular warfare in some cases, and in a lot of cases, really a, a facilitator 
um, alongside these broader Russian geopolitical goals that are manifesting in terms of these different diplomatic and security cooperation agreements. That leads to another question in the chat here that I'll pose um, is, do you see a pattern? You know, I heard Central African Republic, I heard Mali, I heard Sudan, like in the thing, is there a pattern to Wagner's, you know, the entry into the theater, theater entry? Does anybody want to take um, that? Um, Anu, I saw you just yeah. jump in, go for it. Yeah, no, no, I think the pattern that you can um, note to how Wagner operates, it's, it's kind of two patterns, right? First, it has to be a country that feels neglected by the West, um, by their Western partners. So look at the Central African Republic. Um, Wagner came into the country after their entry was pre precipitated by a French um, withdrawal from the country. And you kind of see the same thing in Mali as well, right? They started making moves to enter Mali um, after President Macron announced in June of last year that they were that he was going to um, reduce the number of troops they had in the Sahel. Right um, at its peak, Operation Bakane had about five thousand troops, uh, most of them stationed in Mali. And after President Macron in June was trying to hand over most of the re responsibilities to. Um, firstly, the Malian, uh, the Malian military, but also trying to get uh, more European support on that Operation Takuba, right? That was basically the entry for Wagner to enter into Mali, right? And it, I think it speaks volume that um, the Prime Minister of Mali, uh, Chogo Maiga, said at the UN in September that they felt abandoned, right, by France, right? So it felt like France was kind of, I mean, this conflict, um, it feels like France has kind of been bored by it, tired by this like quagmire that they've been in for almost 10 years without much, um, uh, how do I put it, much progress basically, right? I mean, France has been able to neutralize a lot of the high ranking um, jihadist uh, leaders, but they haven't like made a lot of progress uh, in terms of like just bringing peace to, to the region. So I think that's one of the two, like those are the two patterns that you can spot. And I think just like going by, by that, you could probably see some arrangement. You could see a world where they, they are present in Burkina Faso, right? I mean, they're currently not present there yet, right? But it's, a, it's not, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to suggest that they'll probably be comfortable in Burkina Faso, right? Because Burkina Faso is currently suspended by ECOWAS, right, uh, from the regional bloc. They've also had this uh, military coup in, in January, right? So Wagner also tribes in, um, also tribes where political instability lives, right? So that's, and, and, and I think that's one of the things that we should like keep watching out for, right? Because if a military coup happens, the, uh, the, the response, the Western response, and even like the African response at the level of the AU and ECOWAS is to condemn it, right? And the, the more these countries are uh, shunned and have like no friends, quote unquote, the easier it is for a partner like Wagner to, um, to, to come in, right? I, I think like my last point is, look, uh, in November or thereabouts, the Malian foreign minister went to Moscow to, to, to meet with Sergei Lavrov and they rolled out the red carpet for him, right? No other country has like welcomed the Malian junta since it seized power in, in June of, of last year, right? So Russia like makes these guys feel welcome. And so it's 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 kind of how you can see see the pattern there. We have five minutes left. Um, one of the things that's you know as a non-Africa specialist that's that stuck out in this conversation is you know Russia through its Sort of propaganda efforts has sought to establish itself both as an anti-imperialist and sort of as a vanguard against Islamic extremism, right? This was a lot of arguments that they made in Syria. And I'm hearing broad sort of parallels to what I'm hearing from uh, actual efforts on the, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on, on the on conflicts in Africa. In places where Wagner is welcomed, and I think that's in Central Africa Republic, is this the themes that we're seeing? And implicit in this is that there, there are this idea that the French um, are not good partners against jihadism and perhaps, you know, picking up on those propaganda outlets may in fact actually be stoking it, right? So just taking it to the next step. So uh, open-ended question, but we have about five minutes left. So if anybody wants to take it, um, feel free. Be quick with this because I'm interested to hear other thoughts. I think that we've got probably a couple of people on this call that have spent 
too much time looking at Wagner propaganda and sort of related material. And I'm, I know that that's done wonders for me. It's been very good for me. Um, I would take it a step further. It's not that Russia stokes jihadism within the sort of Wagner narrative, which is defined by the sort of coordinated and unauthentic behavior that they push, which is uh, embodied by the sort of series of movies that Prigozhin has variously bankrolled and supported. France and in various the guy. they're the same thing. They're, they're synonymous with jihadism. They make the they, they claim that the United States, the European Union, France actively support jihadists in order to destabilize African states and effectively keep them subservient to their former masters. That Russia is selflessly and sometimes very explicitly free of charge and out of the goodness of their hearts and due to this sort of long-standing historical legacy of helping out underdogs and anti-colonialism, particularly you know, Mozambique relationship with Perlemo, et cetera, that they're helping to push that back um, and not expecting anything in return. And I think to us that seems silly, but if you're, if you're on the ground and these guys are doing something and the biggest, the one thing that has been said to me that really clarified things to me, um, and there's a lot of explanations for why this happens that, you know, this is obviously not the whole story, but if I live in Mali, I see that Russian uh, private military contractors are dying and getting shot in, the, in their conflict with jihadists. And that's maybe not something that I saw as frequently with the French or the Europeans that were there. That's, we understand that's because of different sort of force protection priorities, et cetera, right? But I'm sure that that has a very significant psychological and propaganda utility. Um, I guess maybe the last we can go around uh, the group for about one minute each. Now, if you were to project forward, you know, Anu, I think you 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 got me thinking. You know, do we expect more Russian PMC um, operations in Africa? potentially given you know, resource constraints going on with the war in Ukraine. Another big question, and I've given everybody two minutes to answer because FPRI uh, events do finish on time. So I know I'll put you on the spot. Raphael, you're next. Uh, Katrina, you're next. Then Jack, and then I'll, I'll close up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's for Wagner, for example, for, for them, it's where is the next big conflict? Where can we have some joy? Um, they've proven... Um, reasonably, I think as Jack mentioned, they've proven um, reasonably effective in the Central African Republic, right? But one thing I always caution about is if you look at their track record outside of Syria, it hasn't really been um, effective, right? I mean, they had this movie that they did in the Central African Republic called The Tourist, where it was a bunch of gun-toting men that came to save the day on the eve of, of an election, right? That's how they like to portray themselves. But I'm always very wary on how we portray them, right? In Mozambique, they flunked out uh, badly. Uh, and now um, Rwanda and, and, and the South Southern African forces are doing a much better job um, keeping the insurgents at bay. They didn't get a lot of joy in Libya uh, fighting alongside after forces, right? So I'm always very cautious about how much we talk about how effective uh, Wagner is as a fighting force, right? But I think definitely they'll be looking at Where's the next conflict? Where can they um, cozy up to the, to the regime? And I think one, one other tool that Russia as a state uses is um, signing a lot of military cooperation agreements. Um, but if you, if you look into the weeds of those agreements, you find out that most of them are really just good PR. Um, they signed a lot of agreements in 2019 after the summit in Sochi and not a lot has actually come out of it since then, right? There hasn't been a lot of progress. And now they're already planning a summit in 2022, I think probably in St. Petersburg, but I don't know how the war is going to affect that. Um, but I think a lot of it is uh, just like a parting, like word of advice for Western partners is that they, like Jack said, they need to be much more attentive than, um, than previously. And I think people just don't, especially like leaders just, don't want to be preached at, right? And it's kind of easy because that's the type of relationship that Russia tries to portray itself. Like we are not going to preach to you. And that's why China has also been uh, popular. It also helps that China has a lot of money to throw around. The Russians don't have that financial left. And I think that's going to be a problem for them as well going forward because you need a lot of money to have this um, 
bilateral relationships. And Russia, they didn't have that money before, and they certainly won't have that money now that their economy has been battered by the effect of the war. Um, thank you very much. Raphael, I think over to you. Um, so here I would note the potential linkage um, between um, Wagner and uh, potential food food crises, food price problems in Africa that have actually resulted from um, the war in Ukraine. Um, as we know, um, uh, many countries in Africa rely heavily on Russian wheat um, and corn oil, as um, both from Russia, sorry, and from Ukraine. Um, this could have some sort of a, of a collective impact with upcoming elections. Um, the four that I pointed to in my most recent paper um, are Angola and Kenya this year, and then next year Sudan and DRC, um, all of which you know have have some some level of internal issues. Some definitely higher than others um, that could align with some attempt at coup proofing um, that would involve Wagner. Um, we'll see if those play out. I think. Um, the other one that would be obvious would be Burkina Faso, as I touched in my paper and uh, several other people have talked about. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Katrina, 30 seconds. Yeah, um, I would just, I think I want to just go back and emphasize something that Jack said earlier, which is that I think that a lot of the reports of, you know, large scale redeployment of Wagner troops from Africa to Ukraine or a shift in focus to Ukraine and abandonment of Africa in light of Ukraine. I think a lot of that is overblown and not well sourced, um, if sourced at all. I think that particularly as Russia suffers major losses, both literal and kind of figurative on the international stage in Ukraine, it's unfathomable that they would just give up the part of their foreign operations that actually are working somewhat in line with how they intend them, uh, failures notwithstanding. So I think absolutely they're going to continue this model in Africa. And I think that it's not set up to necessarily, you know, have each deployment be super long term. These aren't, you know, they're not establishing mining operations the way the Russian mining oligarchs do in fairly stable African states where they can set up a long term many year business model. They're coming in where they see opportunity, where they see weak governance and security crises that they can exploit for financial and geopolitical gain. And when we talk about how successful they are, I think we also need to put it in terms of what are they expecting for success? Because success to Wagner is going in and accomplishing the geopolitical goals and getting some money. The goals for the regimes bringing them in is you know, often, as I think we've all said, coup proofing. It's not necessarily to get at the core of the security challenges and security issues as we would hope. It really is just sort of how do I get the job done well enough so that I can keep the job and so that the government stays in power to keep paying me. And I think that as long as that model continues to work and as long as these countries don't see a viable alternative and insofar as they do see alternatives, Fogner is able to underbid them. I think that they're absolutely going to continue to try to exploit this model. Jack, 15 seconds. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'd echo everything here. They're opportunists. That's, that's, I think, how we should really view how a lot of this selection is happening. There's, yeah, there's a strategic component, but it's largely about where there's opportunity and where Wagner can face off against the West, where they have an advantage on the ground. I, the last thing I'd say is I think it's very important that we closely track the development of their relationship with the Sudanese authorities and their ability to maintain a foothold in Sudan, because that is a case that is interesting due to the fact that they have aligned themselves with a military government that is immensely unpopular. And that sort of coup proofing context, I think is gonna be really important to informing how we can understand their efficacy and their utility into the future when they're operating these roles that aren't just necessarily combat arms or counterinsurgency. But yeah. Uh, with that, thank you everybody for joining. Um, if you're interested in what FPRI has to offer, head on over to our website, fpri.org. Uh, and if you are so moved uh, to become a member of FPRI, because uh, at some levels we are a membership organization, check out the support button in the far right uh, and see what would work for you. So with that, have a good uh, afternoon or evening, everybody. Thank you again to the panelists um, and thank you for the report and have a good day.